In announcing his appointment as Poet Laureate, Mayor Eric Garcetti said, Luis J. Rodriguez is an example of how powerful an impact literature can have on young lives. And as Poet Laureate, he will impact youth across Los Angeles. I have no doubt that Luis will run with his new role and take it to new heights. Rodriguez was born in El Paso, Texas. He grew up in Watts in the East LA area where his family faced poverty and discrimination. A gang member and drug user by the age of 12, by the time he turned 18, Rodriguez had lost 25 of his friends to gang violence, drug overdoses, shootings, and suicide. He wrote about these amazing experiences in two memoirs, It Calls You Back, An Odyssey Through Love, Addiction, Revolutions, and Healing, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, and the well-known, always running, La Vida Loca, Gang Days in LA, winner of the Carl Sandburg Award of the Friends of the Chicago Public Library with half a million copies now sold worldwide. His books of poetry include My Nature is Hunger, New and Selected Poems, 1989 to 2004, winner of a 2006 Patterson Poetry Book Prize, The Concrete River, which won a Penn West Josephine Miles Award for Literary Excellence, Poems Across the Pavement, which received San Francisco State University's Poetry Center Book Award. In addition to this body of work, he is the founder of Tia Chucha Press, which publishes emerging socially conscious poets and the Tia Chucha Central Cultural and Bookstore in Silmar, which serves 18,000 children, teens, young adults, adults, and senior citizens a year in their cultural programming. He captures this body of cultural work when he says, to me, poetry is deep soul talk, a powerful means to enlarge one's presence in the world. Please welcome the Poet Laureate of Los Angeles, Luis J. Rodriguez. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm uh, honored to be here. And I know you all understand if you live in LA how bad the traffic is. Uh, it wouldn't have been so bad, but I did wake up 6 in the morning to leave from Napa. I was in Napa this morning and drove all the way down. I don't mind any of that because I actually love this. I get energized. I love talking to people. I love doing poetry. I love driving. So it works out pretty good. What I can't stand is traffic. That's one thing. Um, I want to start with a poem, not mine, but William Stafford. And then I want to talk a little bit, and I know that you all had a whole day's proceedings, and I know that you're probably tired, but I'm going to get you going because I am going. I am energized. I'm not, I'm not tired because I really believe in what you're doing. I totally think the arts are key to a new world, and I'll explain why. Uh, but let me read you this poem by uh, Wayne Stafford. It's called A Ritual to Read to Each Other. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade holding each elephant's tail, and only a poet would bring elephants in the middle of a poem. But if one wanders, if one wanders the circus won't find the park. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region, and all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. There is a lot of darkness around us. And I think that if we're going to bring light and understanding, some passion and heat, the arts are going to be the way to go. There is a challenge for us to remove or 
uh, how do you say, rebuild, reimagine a whole new world in which every human being becomes complete through the arts. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Every human being becomes complete through the arts. Arts is one thing that we have inherently as part of our being. And I say this because I know there's a lot of people in our community, just LA alone, who have no access to the art, who cannot be artistic, who don't know where to start, who don't know where to even go, who can't get a job. I have a son right now, he's 39 years old. He, as so many people know, he spent 15 years in prison. He's a great kid. He did some bad things, and I don't condone none of the things that he did that was wrong. But he's grown, he's developed, he's trying to do good in this world. He cannot get a job. And he's a poet. Who's going to hire a poet who spent time in prison? we got to have room for everybody. You know what he does right now? He works for Homeboy Industries, which is a great organization. But he works in one of their industries cleaning the drains of LA County. Muck and smell and junk. He's 39 years old, but that's the, what he has to do. That's the option given to him. When I say that the arts are key, that means that a whole new world has to be restructured around it. You understand what I'm getting at? You know how we talk about, well, there is an industry here, there's Hollywood, there is a creative industry, and we think it's great that LA has a multi-billion dollar creative economy, but there's an aspect that I want to bring in about that. It does not incorporate everybody. You have the beautiful Hollywood area, you have life downtown, beautiful lights, you have the beaches, you have the concentration of art in certain areas, certain museums, which are beautiful. I love museums, I love all these places. But then you got miles and miles and miles of territory in this city where there's no bookstores. There is no museums. There's no art galleries. I'll name them, South LA, sections of the harbor, almost all of East LA, the Northeast San Fernando Valley. I'll name these near, near areas. Working class people live and work. The people who help keep things going. Most of they're black and brown, but also poor white, Asian. They're mixed of people who don't have access to song, to theater, to writing, to the drama of expressiveness and instead they have the drama in their lives. Hurting, pain, pain, trauma, all these terrible things that happen because they don't got a place to take it. They don't got a place to take their beautiful dream to find reality. I am fighting for a new LA. Are you gonna fight with me? Yeah. You're gonna fight for this kind of LA. And you know why it has to be new? Because the structural aspects of it is gonna be key. When somebody says that the, if a society is predicated on the arts, a whole new structure has to come along. Uh, our society, and it has a lot of good things, but the one thing that I want to make clear, and I think all of you understand this, is predicated on other things. Commercial profit for one, war. When you have the largest budget in your budget, go to defense. That's not the kind of economy and war I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? And when you got most of people who love the arts, who will do things for the arts, but if it doesn't make any profit, that's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. We gotta have access to the arts and do the arts whether people can afford to do them or not. It cannot be predicated on whether you got the money to do it. You understand? That's why we have to restructure everything. Imagine how it could be structured. What if we say that all our city, everything we had was predicated on everybody being a creative, inventive, imaginative, innovative human being? Then you, ha you have to move things around. That's what governance should do. That's what people in the business should do. That's what all of us in the community should do. Let's find that world, because I will tell you something, and I'll tell it to you right now. If we had that, we wouldn't have the violence in our streets. I know this for a fact. We wouldn't have the lost, disconnected, alienated youth. We wouldn't have people who feel like they don't belong anywhere. They're just cogs in a wheel. We wouldn't have the large number of suicides. 
because the arts connects you to your own nature and in the process connects you to other people's nature and in the process connects you to all of nature. We are one big, giant, huge ecosystem of humanity and, and, and nature and cosmos, and yet without the arts, we feel we're alone, we got nowhere to go, and we don't even know where to begin. This is the darkness that we have to overcome, and we can do it. We can do it in this city. Arts for LA is proof that we can advocate for the arts in every neighborhood. We can have cultural spaces. We can have movie houses. We can have theater. We can have festivals where people can sing and do poetry. All these beautiful things that everybody knows is possible. Because when a community doesn't have those things, you know something's dead inside. And when it has it, you know it's alive. And there are cities that have done this. LA, beautiful, amazing city. I tell you, I love LA. I am very honored to be chosen as poet laureate of LA. I love LA. I don't even know that many people who say they love LA, but I will say it. This is a great city. This is a city in which things can be imagined, reimagined, and reinvented. I am a reinvented human being. And a lot of it has to do with being in LA. Just, yeah. I would just like to see it spread out. I would like more people to tap into this. One of the stories I told the mayor when uh, he introduced me uh, at the Central Public Library, and I'm standing there trying to get this award, and all these great people were there, and the media was there. I told the story that when I was 15 years old, I was a heroin addict. I was in a gang. I was homeless in those streets. And I would sleep everywhere I could, never with other people because I didn't trust nobody. People would always say, why don't you come hang? During the day, I was okay to hang, but at night, I found my own spot. So it was always one place different than the other every night. Abandoned cars, because there used to be a lot more abandoned cars in those days. Any shuttered building I could break into. All night movie theaters. You all remember the all night movie theaters downtown LA? I never had money for them, but I'd sneak in and I'd be there all night. There's so many places to sleep, and then there's so many dangers. But one thing that I remember, the Central Library. It was my refuge. It was the one place where I could go and I could feel safe. Read books. I loved books. Books never dismissed me, never abused me, never told me I never amount to anything. Books were great. They were amazing. One of my favorite books of all time was Charlotte's Web. I read that book like 20 times. I didn't even know English until I started reading books. Books got me into language, into the possibilities, and still there was a sadness there because there was no books by Luis Rodriguez's or Garcia's or Sanchez's or people like that. And it didn't matter, I still would read them. And I remember that one day uh, uh, one of the librarians put out a, a special section, just, I don't know why entirely, but it's a black experience books. And that was the first time I ever got the chance to read autobiography of Malcolm X and uh, Man Child of the Promised Land by Claude Brown and uh, you know, George, uh, what I mean, James Baldwin. And then I remember the book that I loved more than anything was Down These Mean Streets by Perry Thomas, the Puerto Rican. Oh my God, that was, these books were like, I loved it. These guys were mostly from back east, Harlem, 2,000, 3,000 miles away, but guess what? I can relate to them. They were African American, but they were living my life. That's why I love libraries, and here it is full circle now. 40 years later, I am now poet laureate, and I'm standing there in that same central library where I was lost and confused and in the streets, and here I am now able to do it. You can change, you can reinvent, but it takes a lot of here and a lot of here, and I think the whole city should have that. Have a lot of heart, have a lot of intelligence, and we can remake the city to the kind of city that everybody wants to be here, and everybody's invited, and everybody's welcome. A unity in diversity. All this diversity, all these voices, all these flavors, all these languages, they should all be heard. I don't necessarily have to hear a good poem in, port, in, in, in my language to understand it. One time, I remember a Japanese guy got up to read. I didn't understand any of it, but it was the most beautiful reading I've ever been to. The way he moved, the rhythm, it's like, this is great. It isn't even a language, necessarily. 
It's just knowing that you can be expressive, that you can speak, that you can paint, that you can do these wonderful things. This is what we got to fight for in the city. And this is what I know that you're prepared to do. Because it's going to be a fight. I think, in my opinion, we got a mayor that's going to be part of that fight. I think we got a mayor that's going to support that. And Mr. Garcetti, and I'll let him know. If he isn't, I will be one of the first ones to let him know that. Because <laughs> I don't think he appointed me to be you know, somebody that you know, will always go along with what he says. But I really do think this mayor is open to it. And we need to put him in account for it, Make, let him know. Yes, we will support you if you bring the arts everywhere, if you allow more budgets in the arts. The arts budgets is very low compared to the city. Why? We have more money in our juvenile halls and the probation camps, m much more money. And I'll tell you another story, because I do poetry and workshops in the juvenile halls. I go to the probation camps. I meet with these kids. And five minutes from my house is the largest juvenile lockup in North America, if not the world, the NIDARF Juvenile Hall. And I go in there periodically, talk to these kids. It's a wonderful experience. And the last time I was there, it was for a big poetry event. I think it was Inside Out was doing their graduation, the poetry. It was really beautiful, and they invited me to speak, and I had a great time. I met a lot of great young people. Uh, and there was one 14-year-old boy, beautiful baby-faced little guy, and his mother and his grandmother was there, and he got up to read a poem. It was a great little poem. It was beautiful, 14-year-old kid. And you know, I never ask kids what they're in there for. I never ask them what, they're, what time they're going to do. I just, but somebody did come up and wanted to stop, wanted me to know. That kid was facing 135 years in prison. You need to know this. This is in LA. This is in the United States of America. This is injustice. I don't know the whole story about what he did or didn't do. But we just can't throw away our people, our youth. If they're in trouble, there should be consequences. But you know what those consequences are mostly consist of? They're hating. Help them get stronger. Help them get smarter. Help them heal. And the arts are one of the most powerful ways to heal anybody. Because you're not going to be able to get a drug addicted gang member like me to just change from that unless those books were healing. Unless that arts was healing. You're not going to do that, but it was healing. It is medicine. The arts are medicine. People say, you know, I'm a diabetic, and they give me these pills, you know. And the doctor says, you know, here's your medicine. I know better. It's not med this is not medicine. You know where the medicine is? It's inside of me. My own body's medicine. This is not medicine. It might help my own body heal, you understand? It might help because I need it. I'm diabetic. That's bad news. I didn't realize how bad it was until I got it. I have diabetes in my family, and you know, you hear about these people losing their legs and, and their eyes, but I don't know why you just keep going on, and then finally you get diabetic, and then you realize, man, this is a pain in behind. It's terrible to be diabetic. So they gave me these pills, and you know what? I told the doctor, no, that I have the capacity to heal within me. You are here to help me heal. You're not my healer, you understand? Well, he is my healer, but not in the sense that with, without him I can't do it. I just need help. And the same goes with somebody who's psychologically or spiritually hurting, psychologically or spiritually lost, psychologically or spiritually confused. They got the medicine inside of them. They got their own lifeline. I found it in books and art. I found it, and now I help others find it because I believe in it, because I know it works. I have seen tattooed face, heavy duty gangsters come alive with art. I've been to El Salvador in seven prisons where the only thing that helps them is they start creating artistic things. I was in Ciudad Juarez in 2010. You know Ciudad Juarez at the time was the murder capital of the world in Chihuahua, Mexico, where I was born. I was born in El Paso, Texas, but we never lived there. We lived in Ciudad Juarez. And I went there in 2010 where there was so much death. The rate of it was four or five times worse than the, the worst rate in other countries. 
And I spent two weeks talking to people there. And I also went to a juvenile hall there. And I also went to a prison there. And I remember the juvenile hall talking to one young man who was actually talking to the media because the media showed up because I was there. And we had this great talk with all these kids and they were, he was talking to some media and somebody asked him, why are you in the drug cartel? He's a, he was a young man. Why are you involved with this? And he says, you know why? Because I don't have nothing. And I've seen the slums in Ciudad Juarez. The slums, they had, they've always had slums, but now, miles and miles of planks with cardboard, chicken wire, and plastic. And he says, I don't got nothing. But you know what? With the drug cartel, I'll have probably two years in which I will have lived. I'll have a SUV, maybe I'll have some food, a roof over my head, and I know they're gonna kill me, he says. I know they'll probably cut my hands, cut my arm, they cut my head off, but it doesn't matter. At least for two years, I will have lived. That's desperation. And if you think it's just in Ciudad Juarez, go to some of these neighborhoods in LA, you see it's there too. You know what I told them? The arts. The arts. You know now, I've, I've heard since, since then, that Juno Hall has murals all on the outside of it now. They have started to do arts and poetry. In fact, we did a poetry festival before I left. They even started uh, you know, I have a beautiful center in Silmar called Tia Chuchas, from, named for my aunt. They started one called Mama Juana's based on ours, emulating us. And they told me that the violence in Juarez is still bad, but it's not as bad as it used to be. But one thing they've noticed, there's been an explosion of arts in these communities. So I know the powerful means that arts is. And I think that we have to take that message everywhere we go. And again, I'm glad there's museums, I'm glad there's Disneyland, I'm glad there's beaches, I'm glad there's Hollywood, but I ain't good enough for me. I want everybody in their neighborhood to be able to have access to these things, to be able to have access to how to create, how to think, how to have computer technical uh, things behind them, but also how to imagine something different. Because the lack of imagination is one of the reasons why people want to die when they're 18 years old. Why they want to kill? Because there's no other way to imagine another way to live. What the arts is, is a powerful relationship to options. And that's what we got to fight for, so that everyone has that in their hands. And I want to say this to you all because I know you believe this and I know that you're already doing this work. But what I'm going to ask you is to do more. I'm going to ask you to take this as a fight for our lives. Take it to the schools. Take it everywhere you can. Take it to the churches. Take it everywhere you can. When I wanted to become a writer, my beautiful family, hard working class, working class people, there's eight, my dad had eight kids and 30 grandkids by the time he died. He's had more than many since then. And only one finished college. They're just working class people. Nothing wrong with them. But I remember all the gangs and drug stuff I was doing, people thought that was crazy. And then when I decided to become a writer at around 25, 26, they thought I was really nuts. <laughs> he's lost, he's forgetting, he's lost cause now. They wrote me off completely when I said, I want to be a writer, that's it, you know, forget it. It's hard to be a writer, artist, poet in this world when even your own family sometimes can't see you. So we have to find a way for community to see our young people again, to see them. And even if they're troubled, build a life out of that trouble. Trouble is how you make a life. And plus you're gonna be in trouble one way or the other, so you might as well learn how to be in good trouble. You understand what I'm saying? I always tell people, you know, the one big trouble that we have is you don't find your destiny, you don't find your gifts, you don't know where your art is. That's one big trouble. But the other trouble is you do find it. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of trouble, but it's better there. It's better in that place than the other place. So that's what we got to fight for, to recognize that everybody is an artist of some kind, in some form, and to give them the skills and knowledge so their own gifts can come out. 
So they know that they're gifts to the world, and they know they're giving a boon to the world, because that's what they're here to do. That's the hero's journey. That's the battle for everybody to be able to participate in. And I'll tell you one last thing, then I'm going to help you hopefully think about this and I also want to let you know that as Paul Lurie I will work with you in any way I can to make sure we take this message far and wide. I will have as many connections as I can to communities throughout LA so that we can make sure that there is not just poetry but all the arts involved. But I'm going to tell you one thing. How many have read the Odyssey by Homer? And how many know, uh, well let me display my take on it. I study these things when I was a kid, I never got a chance to read any of these things. I never read Shakespeare. I never saw a Shakespeare play until I was 45 years old. And when I saw it, I was in tears. Because it was beautiful. And I wished I was a kid and I'd seen it. You know what I mean? 45 years old, a grown man, I finally saw a play of Shakespeare. So I read all these things and I started reading Homer's Odyssey, just like all the classics. And I began to see something in it that a lot of people don't see. And I'm going to share it with you. For one thing, it's, it's the foundation of Western literature, Homer's works, right? Pretty much, it's where everybody goes to when you, where's the beginning, it's really Homer. And, but people don't rec recognize that he, his stories were told orally for a thousand years. So the ch story's changed. Finding what is written down is pretty much what you're getting. But even the part that's written down is quite amazing. To me, the essence of that book, and probably the essence of all Western literature, is the struggle to find home, to get back home. And I don't just mean a structural home place, I mean a home inside of you, to know that within you is that lifeline, is those gifts, is that power. You have it, that authority, that personal authority that most people don't feel they have. Get to that authority. We all have it. All these kids have it. That 14-year-old kid at the Silmar Juman all has it. Get kids back to that. That book is really about getting home, back inside. And the first part doesn't even talk about Odysseus. You know how when you see movies about the Odyssey or read, they always talk about the amazing adventures. You know, he went to war for 10 years, Troy, the Trojan War, and then he was on his, these adventures, trying to get back home for 10 years. He got lost. He, could, he met the Chaclops. He met the, all these you know, t terrible things. He lost all his crew. But here's a story that's interesting to me. In the beginning, it's not even about him. It's about his son, Telemachus. His son did not have, never knew his father. His son was a tiny baby when he left. And he's grown up with no really good guidance. His mother's amazing. His mother's trying to keep things going. And the suitors have invaded the kingdom because they want to take over Odysseus' land and they want to do everything they can. And the mom's holding it off with all this clever stuff she does, you know, like sewing that, that that robe and telling them when I get it done I'll, I'll pick a suitor and she would unravel it every day you know so she was very smart but still it was getting weird and they used to make fun it was getting hard but they used to make fun of Telemachus you dummy what a punk you know what I mean he can't even stand up for himself because you know he just didn't know how to be a man didn't know how to stand up didn't know what it meant and I don't mean a man like a tough guy just a man with a range of emotions and a range of things that all human beings should have he didn't know so he was getting very sad, and then he realized, you know what, I gotta find my dad. He's been gone 20 years, I gotta find him, because I can't keep doing this. So he goes to his teacher, whose name is Mentor. That's where the Mentor comes from. People don't even know this. I had people, I said, we talk mentors all the time, but where does Mentor come from? We don't even know. He's his teacher, infused with the spirit of Athena, the feminine spirit, and what he, Mentor says, I will guide you. I will be the captain of your ship on your journey. So Telemachus and Mentor get on the ship and they go off to look for his dad. And as you probably know reading the book, you know he, never does, he doesn't really find his dad. But he comes back, and just when he comes back, his dad has come landed on the, on the land. But now Telemachus is a man. He's been somewhere, you know what I mean? He's had ordeals, he's been on a journey. He didn't necessarily have to find his dad, but he found something inside him. Maybe the father spirit inside of him got engaged. And he comes back. Now he's stronger. And now father and son unite. And they go out and get rid of all the suitors and help Penelope. And it all ends with a happy ending. But anyway, the idea is, though, that beautiful relationship between a teacher, a guide, a captain, 
Our young people need this. You all should be mentors. Every one of you should find one young person that you can find and teach. And a mentor doesn't tell people what to do. A mentor doesn't, just doesn't just take them to the mountains. That's all nice. A mentor gives them knowledge, gives them skills, and they give them specific skills that those young people are looking for, their own particular art, their own particular place where their gifts lie. And they do it with passion and respect. We need more of those. Because if we can create a community that allows every one of you to be mentors, and every one of you have at least one young man, young, one young woman, that you can teach and show them the ropes, we wouldn't have violence in the city. We wouldn't have the drug addiction problems. We wouldn't have the suicide numbers. I'm convinced of it. And that's what we all should be convinced. We should convince, be convinced that the art saves lives. It gives people meaning, powerful meaning. It gives people a sense that they should be alive, but not only that, they should help shape the world. That's what the arts does. It says you just don't have to take what people are giving you, make it your own, make it different, make it powerful, make it for others to be able to survive and live and be the kind of creative, complete human being they can be that only artists can be. That's the world that I'm fighting for, and I'm asking you to join with me, and please do everything you can to make sure we have that world. Thank you all very much.